the teaching of the Nicolaitans, part five. And this is for radical disciples during these very, very last days. If you'd like to have this presentation as well as video recordings of all previous sessions, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. And I'll be very happy to give you the a link for the YouTube video as well as this PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to continue saying something about physical church facilities and church buildings. In a communist country, a congregation can have thousands of people without owning or using a large physical facility. They meet instead in homes and other improvised spaces where there can be Acts style community and fellowship. Acts 5 verse 42, this is what we see in the early church day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And of course, you remember earlier, I mentioned that after the persecution that took place in connection with the martyrdom of Stephen, uh, they were scattered from Jerusalem. They no longer met in the temple courts. They were scattered. Now, in Vietnam, some meetings were held on riverboats. It is better not to follow the traditional Western model in which ministry is centered in a building. Dare we not instead follow the model found in the New Testament? and trust God to make us produce fruit that really lasts? Dare we not stop following the model of church in the West and simply go back to the Bible? I think we must, especially during these last days when there's going to be persecution against the church. Will not the church be better prepared for what is to come? For example, the outright persecution as prophesied in Matthew 24, verse 9. Then Jesus said, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Hated by all nations because of me. If you'd like to read about this, click on that link, Attacks on Christian Surge by astonishing amount. Let me share with you a story from China. This took place a few years ago. In China, where at one time the underground house church model appeared to be very, very fruitful, there is the story of a church of many thriving house churches which decided to follow the Western model. They built a facility capable of seating up to 50,000 people. Prior to this, they had many, many thousands of people meeting in many, many little house churches. But they decided to follow the Western model of building a mega church, a mega facility. After this facility was completed, the communist authorities shut down the facility using hundreds of police and armed thugs in a blatant show of force and violence. The communists just took over the building after it was completed. Quoting from the report in the United Kingdom Daily Mail Online, quote, house churches have been around for decades but their growth has accelerated in recent decades. Sadly, I insert that, producing larger and larger congregations that are far more conspicuous, far more visible, especially to the communist authorities, than the small groups of friends and neighbors that used to worship in private homes. You see what happened. Thus, inviting persecution, and unnecessary suffering from the communist authorities. This was taken from uh, the UK Daily Mail. Is it possible that house church congregations in China would have been better off continuing to follow the New Testament house church model? 
instead of the model of its Western counterparts? And I would say the answer is yes. Was the persecution they suffered at the hands of the communists at that time really necessary? Perhaps not. Here's a challenge that I would like to issue for radical disciples. Wherever the Lord has put you here on earth, you can heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God, leading souls to Jesus Christ. You then meet with them often in your home, in your home, where you teach them to be fruit bearing disciples of our Lord. You disciple them in your home. In that way, your group will continue to divide and thus the number of believers multiplied. In other words, your house church will divide, become two and then four and then eight and then 16 and thus the number of believers are multiplied. The key here is making disciples of every believer. Now, why Jesus hates the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Okay, this is part five. After this, uh, I will be done with the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, from past sessions, we know that the gospel was to give us freedom from sin, freedom from the punishment of sin, freedom from death, freedom from punishment in hell. That was the basic purpose of the gospel through Jesus Christ, his death and the resurrection, to give us freedom from sin and its consequences. And of course, this kind of freedom was meant only for the redeemed, meant only for believers, meant only for followers of Jesus Christ. Only when you are redeemed by faith in Jesus Christ are you free from sin and death. But now, Due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, that freedom from sin has become freedom to sin. And this freedom to sin is now for everyone in that culture, including the unredeemed, including those who do not know Jesus Christ, including those who are led by their sinful and fallen nature. Freedom from sin has become freedom to sin, and this is a consequence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Let me give you a, one example of an extreme situation caused by the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Again, uh, due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, we have something called freedom, meaning freedom to sin, not freedom from sin. Okay. It turns out that there is a, an FX series entitled Little Demon, which is owned and marketed by Disney, all right? And let me share with you the content. This Little Demon is a animated show, meaning it's a cartoon show meant for children. It's about a woman who mates with Satan and produces the Antichrist, all right? Okay, in America, we have freedom of expression freedom of speech. If we want, we can create such shows. If you want to read more about this, click on the link, okay? Now, I'm sure that once this comes out, there will be children who watch this who will be drawn to it. Who will be drawn to it? Many will be turned off, of course, but many children will be drawn to it. But sadly, this is a result of the freedom that we have due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Freedom to follow our fallen nature. This is an article from WND, which stands for Will Net Daily, Fake Christians and Their Impact on the Culture. Let me read to you an excerpt. The compromising or consumer-friendly church and pastors, which substitute the offensive truths of the scripture with more culturally friendly versions, which make their receptive, respective congregations happy instead of accountable. Okay. Now, based on what I've taught before, I believe that you're all very familiar with this. Okay. Now, the article goes on to say, this type of a church is analogous to a rotting apple, 
which starts from the inside, the pastor, and works its way out to the congregation. Now, according to my perspective, it's actually the other way around. Okay? It doesn't start with the pastor. It starts from the outside, that is, the culture, the culture, Western culture. And then it works its way inside the church to the pastor and then to the congregation. Again, this is a consequence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans. It's the culture which creates fake Christians. The culture. And the culture, the post-Christian anti-God culture in which we now live, is a result of the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And then the article goes on to say, Christian anorexia, a total failure of far too many Christians to take the time, the discipline, and the persistence to study scripture, to understand the basic truths and reject any empty philosophy that departs from it. Too many Christians are biblically illiterate. And again, this is a result of the teaching of the Nicolaitans. This is what happened to the church as a result of the gospel having been embedded in Western culture for centuries. What happens? The culture changes the church and its message. Why? Because the church wants to succeed. It wants to grow. It wants to multiply in the culture. And therefore, it has to conform to the culture. You want to read the article? Click on that link from WorldNet Daily. This is due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. It has changed the life-giving gospel into the take-it-or-leave-it institutional world religion known around the world as Christianity. Take it or leave it. Doesn't matter. Go to church. You don't go to church. Who cares? Take it or leave it. So it's no longer the life-giving gospel, but now it's an institutional religion, just like Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so forth. Let me give you another example of an extreme caused by the teaching of the Nicolaitans. This has to do with freedom. Now, in the West, we are free to love the world and to indulge in greed. We are free to do that. Our culture makes it perfectly acceptable to love the things of the world and to indulge in greed. In fact, if you don't love the world, they think something's wrong with you. First John 2, verse 15 and 16, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Luke 16, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But today, I believe there are many Christians who try to serve both God and money. The teaching of the Nicolaitans, which has caused the message of the church to conform to the materialistic culture of the West, has resulted in greed in some circles of the church. In some churches, prosperity teaching has led believers to think that the Lord desires all his people to prosper materially. That one teacher says that God wants all of us to be millionaires. We're talking about U.S. dollars, of course. They then end up loving the things of the world. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? 
Here's an article I want to share with you. There is a mega preacher whose name is Creflo Dollar, who is quite well known here in the United States. Okay. Uh, he was a prosperity preacher, but now he made a statement saying that his preaching on tithing was all wrong. Let me read to you an excerpt from this article. Mega church preacher Creflo Dollar. I don't think that's his real name, has had a change of heart. Dollar, Pastor Dollar, who is the CEO of a mega church. How do you like that? He's a CEO. Sounds like a business, doesn't it? Sounds like a business organization. He is the CEO of a mega church near Atlanta. He at one time preached the prosperity gospel. While it has worked to make him one of the wealthiest black preachers with a net worth of an estimated 27 million US dollars, Pastor Dollar said he is no longer urging his nearly 30,000 member congregation to tithe 10% of their income to the church. He has changed. He said, during a recent sermon entitled The Great Misunderstanding, Pastor Dollar said, the 10% tithe concept was a rule cited in the Old Testament. Since he is preaching for the New Testament, his followers did not need to submit to that rule. Instead, he noted under the New Testament, people can tithe whatever they are comfortable with, more or less than 10%. Now, I actually agree with this. The, the point is, before this, he was the pastor of a mega church who preached extreme prosperity, making him, of course, extremely rich. Let me share with you three consequences of Nicolaitan freedom, quote unquote. Now, in the past, as we have mentioned in earlier sessions, European materialism, European greed led to the colonization instead of the evangelization of third world peoples resulting in what is happening now, the present, it has resulted in likely guilt over past colonization. The first world countries like America and the West, especially European countries, they feel guilt over what they have done in the past in terms of colonizing countries in the third world and the resulting current woke cancel culture in the West from hating God and his holy commands. You see, people in America and the West, they realize that what was done in the past, like colonization, colonialism was wrong. And so now they want to, yeah, in a sense, repent. And so, but it has been taken over by something called the woke cancel culture, gone to the very opposite extreme. And their repentance has not been in the Lord, not at all, but simply because they feel guilty for what their ancestors have done. And so now there is a woke cancel culture in the West. And that woke cancel culture gives them the freedom to hate our traditions, to hate Judeo-Christian traditions to hate God, to hate his holy commands. That is what has happened in the present due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. It all comes from Nicolaitan freedom, freedom, freedom has resulted in these things. Now, the third consequence, now conservatives, especially Christians, born again Christians and politically conservative Americans, they fear losing their freedom of speech. Yeah. Isn't that ironic? In America, the land of freedom of speech, forget what it is, the First Amendment, Second Amendment, is one of the amendments, freedom of speech. But now conservatives fear losing their freedom of speech in this so-called land of freedom. How ironic, how ironic, okay? Because of Nicolaitan freedom, now, People are allowed to believe whatever they want to believe. They are allowed to hate God. They are allowed to hate the Bible, to hate Judeo-Christian traditions. And as a result of that hate, now there is a backlash against conservatives, against those who fear God, who believe in our Judeo-Christian traditions. There is a backlash against them. And so 
conservatives now fear losing their freedom of speech. So ironic, so ironic. And number four, the fourth consequence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, greed in the church and in some church leaders. Let's go back to greed. Excuse me, there are four consequences, not only three. Four consequences of the Nicolaitan freedom. More on greed a bit later. Now, let me share with you one ironic benefit of Nicolaitan teaching. This one is quite amazing. It is very, very ironic, okay? Here, as a result of long ago past colonization by England, by Great Britain, we in this group, we are from different racial groups, and we consist of believers from opposite ends of the earth, we can share and encourage one another in English. <laughs> Think about that. We have people in America, we have people in India, we have people in Malaysia, and we can encourage one another in the same language, in English. Why is that? Well, the answer is obvious. Because India was colonized by Great Britain, so was Malaysia. And of course, America began with the 13 colonies, English colonies. Isn't that interesting? Because of this Nicolaitan teaching, now we from different parts of the world, different racial groups, we have white, we have black, we have Asian, we can share, encourage one another in English. And another benefit with regard to the preaching of the gospel, this is another benefit. English is now the international language replacing Koine Greek. Now, 2000 years ago, uh, the international language in Europe was Koine Greek. And so Paul was able to preach the gospel to the ends of the known world using Koine Greek, using the international language, which many people understood 2000 years ago in the known world. Today, English is the international language. And because I speak English, wherever I go in the world to teach or preach the gospel, I can be understood or I can find an interpreter who knows English. The Lord knows, the Lord knows, the Lord knows. Now, let's have a look at the origin of greed in the church, greed. Jesus said to two of the churches in Revelation, you recall, Revelation 2.14, there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrifice, to idols and committed sexual immorality. Now, how about the teaching of Jezebel? Let's look at that, Revelation 2.20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Therefore, the teachings of Balaam and Jezebel are very, very similar. They talk about idolatry, talk about sexual immorality, okay? They're very similar. Now, what are these two teachings for the church today? How do we interpret those two teachings today for the church? Well, here, eating food sacrificed to idols is idolatry or worshiping a false god or being unfaithful to God. So when Revelation says eating food sacrificed to idols, that's essentially talking about being unfaithful to God. I don't think there were any believers who actually had idols in the home, okay, which they were worshiping. No, but they were simply being unfaithful to God through some kind of idolatry in their hearts. Now, how about sexual immorality? Well, sexual immorality refers to being unfaithful to one's one and only spouse, symbolizing being unfaithful to God. So actually, those two teachings, the teaching of Balaam, the teaching of Jezebel, they refer to being unfaithful to God. Sexual immorality, eating food sacrificed to idols, those were meant were those referred to being unfaithful to God. 
Colossians 3, verse 5, Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is what? Idolatry. So the idolatry of which we see taught in the teaching of Balaam, the teaching of Jezebel, that idolatry is actually greed for New Testament believers. First John 2 verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world or anything in the world, love for the Father is not in them. Loving the world and its things means that we do not love the Father. Loving the world gives birth to the twins of greed and idolatry, which again results in people being unfaithful to God. The teachings of Balaam and Jezebel, therefore, encourage greed and loving the things of the world, something that we saw in those two churches. And these two things are idolatry in the New Testament. Greed and loving the things of the world constitute idolatry for New Testament believers. Now, these teachings, teaching of Balaam and Jezebel, are alive and well in some streams of the church today in the form of extreme prosperity teaching. The teaching of the Nicolaitans provides fuel for the teachings of Balaam and Jezebel in the church today. Now, how is that? How is that? Here, the institutionalization of the church within a materially prospering culture naturally encourages greed and loving the world within the church. Once the church is institutionalized within a materially prospering culture, guess what? That culture changes the church, changes the message of the church, encourages greed and loving the world within the church. Here, you want to click on that uh, link? It'll take you to a YouTube and you see that there are pastors who wear very, very expensive shoes. These pastors are wearing shoes that cost anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 US dollars for a pair of shoes. Now, these are pastors. These are pastors. They make their living from the gospel. These are not multi billionaire businessmen. These are pastors, and they wear a pair of shoes that can cost up to 5,000 US dollars. Hmm. Ah, Instagram account catalogs pastors wearing luxury watches up to 400,000 US dollars. Uh, the pastor you see in the photo here, his watch costs about 8,500 US dollars. It's a Rolex Datajust 36. What effect do you think this has on the attitude of the mainstream culture in the West toward Christianity? Christians are hypocrites. That gives them an excuse to hate Christians and Christianity. But actually, this is not found in the gospel. No, but it is found in the church, but not found in the gospel or the word of God. Let me share with you. What I believe is the role of America and the West in the very last days. I'm going to begin with Paul's second missionary journey in the book of Acts. Okay. Now, uh, I hope you can all see my cursor there. Okay. My cursor now, I am circling Damascus in Syria. This is where Paul began his second missionary journey in Damascus. He left, he went to Antioch, and then he went through Galatia. Okay, see this green area? That's all Galatia. He went through Galatia. He went through Phrygia right there. And then he went through Asia. Now, 
Asia is currently Turkey. Okay, this is Turkey. He went through Asia. Notice he's going in, he's going in the westward direction. He's going west. Okay. And so he's going west all the way to Mycia, and then he goes all the way to Troyas. He's heading in the west, westward direction. Finally, he ends up in Macedonia, which is Greece, Greece, present day Greece. And then from there, he goes back, he returns all the way back to Damascus, where he began. Okay, let's look at the details of Paul's second missionary journey. Acts 16, 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia, as I mentioned earlier, and Galatia. Okay, they see this green part, that's Galatia. Paul traveled through Galatia. He traveled through Phrygia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. The Holy Spirit kept him from preaching the gospel in Asia. Uh, today known as Turkey. And so he kept on going westward. He kept on going west because the Holy Spirit would not let him stop here to preach the gospel. And so he kept on going. When they came to the border of Mycia, they tried to enter Bithynia. They tried to go east to Asia, eastward to preach the gospel in Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go east. No. So, what did Paul do? So, they passed by Mycia and went down to Troyas. So, Paul ended up in Troyas. Now, you know what happened to him while he was in Troyas? Well, verse 9, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So, while he was in Troyas, during the night, he had a dream of a man, a vision of a man calling him to come to Macedonia. So guess what? After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them in Macedonia, which is present day Greece. So you notice the Holy Spirit led Paul westward into Western Europe and not toward Asia, not toward India, not toward China, but westward toward Western Europe. We see that at that time, the Lord guided Paul west to Europe instead of east to what we now call Asia to share the gospel. And so the Holy Spirit did not lead Paul to India, to China, Southeast Asia, no. But at that time, the Holy Spirit led him west to Europe. And it is possible that later Paul kept going west all the way to Spain. Romans 15, 24, I plan to do so when I go to Spain, said Paul. So here we see, this is his first mission, uh, second missionary journey. He ended up in Macedonia, recall? That's Greece, okay? And then Paul says that he was going to go eventually westward, continuing his western travel all the way to Spain. And what do we have right in between here? Western Europe, Western Europe, Western Europe. So this is how the gospel eventually spread to Western Europe through the Apostle Paul. It began with the Apostle Paul, who was led by the Holy Spirit to go west instead of to go east to what we call Asia today. Therefore, it was by the leading of the Holy Spirit that the gospel was first taken west to present-day Western Europe. It eventually arrived in the United Kingdom. Eventually, of course, it was taken to North America by the pilgrims. Catholic Europeans colonized South America. But due to fallen human nature, the Europeans eventually used the eventual material blessings of the gospel to make colonies of third world nations instead of making disciples of all nations. Most sadly, this has led to what is now called white supremacy and in the past, racism against non-white people. 
I believe that is how it began. Thus, the quote, religion of Christianity and white supremacy came to be related. I believe you can see that. I'm talking about the religion of Christianity, what it became due to the influence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans. This religion of Christianity came to be associated with white supremacy. But very sadly, this, of course, was a result of the teaching of the Nicolaitans working through man's fallen nature. This was not God's plan. But of course, God knew what would happen in advance. It was never a result of the Great Commission as commanded by our Lord Jesus to make disciples of all nations and not colonies of all nations. The novel concept of freedom for everyone would eventually be born as the gospel was spread, yes, especially to the United States, and it led to the advent of America and the American dream. We all know about the American dream. Oh, I believe the whole world knows about the American dream, which is based on what? Capitalism and the Protestant work ethic, and those things are good for this life. Capitalism, Protestant work ethic are good for this life. Uh, what is the Protestant work ethic? It says that material reward and earthly success are deservedly the result of diligence and hard work. Yes, 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 I believe that. But all of this was based on freedom for all, meaning, of course, freedom for all fallen human beings. Now, freedom for fallen mankind is leading to perhaps the final consequence. And what is the final consequence? Reverse racism and discrimination against whites in the West. That is now beginning. Reverse racism against Caucasians. And it's also against Christianity, because Christianity is related as a white man's religion. So now there is discrimination against whites in the West, against the religion of Christianity, against what is the white man's religion. See, Christianity is considered the white man's religion, the European religion, and against, of course, its Judeo-Christian values and traditions. This appears to be leading to the advent of socialism in the West, so-called equality for all peoples now in this life, and eventually leading to the one world government, the final goal of the Antichrist. Let me share with you an article. The article says, liberals worship mandated compliance. When I say liberals, I'm talking about the other side, the other side. Liberals worship mandated compliance. They deride true individualism. They are morally bankrupt, intellectually dishonest calumniators who create laws not for safety, not for community well-being, but as tools to force compliance. That's what they're looking for, compliance. When the culture mandates compliance, the stage will be set for the one world government. Now, let me share about the role of the legalization of marijuana in some states in America's decline. In some United, in some states in America, uh, marijuana, smoking marijuana, has become legalized. Let me share with you the role. This is what I read. So, in your assessment of what has gone wrong in America and why so many people have gotten swept up in nonsensical Antifa and 
Black Lives Matter delusions and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual lunacy submitted mindlessly to medical tyranny, I believe that refers to the pandemic, or have dropped out of the workforce to collect welfare and to laze around at home, don't forget the skunk factor. The skunk is an animal, of course, which stinks. It has a terrible, terrible smell. And that stink you are smelling in the presence of a pothead, meaning a marijuana user, is not just the dope himself, it is the toxic stench of deliberate civilization destroying social engineering by an elite class who wants everyone stoned, meaning high on marijuana, to better control us. Again, this is from World Net Daily, if you'd like to read the article. And this eventually opens the way for the one world government of the Antichrist. Now, for the teaching of the Nicolaitans and the anointing, the anointing. The teaching of the Nicolaitans also opens the way for an unscriptural understanding of what is called the anointing. What is this popular understanding? What is the popular understanding of anointing? Well, it is the following. Only certain pastors or leaders have this anointing. Only some, not all pastors, but only some pastors have this anointing. What is it? Well, it is a special anointing, which enables only them, only anointed pastors, to minister in a certain supernatural way. It's a special anointing for only certain pastors. And this, of course, will set them apart from other leaders, from other pastors, and even more, even more apart from the lay people, even more apart from the lay people. This promotes and further reinforces the teaching of the Nicolaitans. You recall the teaching of the Nicolaitans separates the professional clergy from the laity, okay? Creates a separate class, a separation. Now, this anointing makes it even worse. Now, there is a certain class of pastors which are anointed, which are above those pastors who are not anointed. And it further separates these anointed pastors from the laity, reinforcing the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Next week, we will begin to study the anointing using scriptures from the King James Version of Matthew 24. We will study selected verses from Matthew 24, which teach about the deception to take place in the church during the last days. Here, I'm reading from the King James Version, Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to us. He said, Take heed that no one deceives you, deceives us. It's a command. We have to be careful that no one deceives us. Verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, that verse 5 actually doesn't make any sense. Jesus is talking about what's going to happen during the last days, and now we are in the last days. And Jesus said, at that time, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Many, meaning many servants of God will appear and they will say, I am Christ. And many will be deceived, meaning many believers will be deceived. Well, let me ask you, what if this Sunday you go to church, tomorrow you go to church and you have a guest speaker and he stands up and goes to the podium and then he says, I am Christ. How many of you would believe him that he is indeed the Christ? Well, none of you would believe that he is the Christ, right? None of you. Because when Jesus comes, he's not going to come wearing a suit on a Sunday morning in church. 
he's going to be descending from the heavens like lightning, okay? But according to Jesus, many will be deceived. But I would say none of us is going to be deceived if someone comes to us saying, I am Christ, and we will reject that person. None of us will be deceived. So how do we interpret verse 5? Ah, we're going to look at this at our next session a week from today. How do we interpret this such that it makes sense? And Matthew 24, 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Jesus is talking about the last days, and I believe we're in the last days. Where are the, where are the false prophets? Jesus says there are many. Do you know any false prophets? Do you, I believe some of us could not name a single false prophet. But Jesus says many false prophets will arise, and this will be in the church, not outside the church, in the church. And Jesus says many will be deceived. This does not make any sense. We don't know any false prophets, and none of us is being deceived. No, Jesus says many will be deceived. So next week, we're going to find out how to interpret, how to understand these warnings from Jesus. Another one, Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christs, false Christs, and false prophets. And they shall show great signs and wonders. Oh, okay. One sign of a false Christ or a false prophet is that they will have miracles accompanying their ministry. Great signs and wonders. Okay. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, what does this mean? The very elect includes you and me. It means that these false Christs and false prophets, because they do great signs and wonders, some of us can be deceived. Us. So it would behoove us to understand what Jesus is talking about here. Who are these false Christs? Who are these false prophets? Let me give you a hint. The word Christ in Greek is Christos, Christos. And the literal meaning of Christos is anointed. The literal meaning of Christ is anointed. At our next session, we will study the anointing in the New Testament. Join us again a week from today. Now, I'm going to share an excerpt from Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, our missionary adventures in West Borneo from 1978 to 1987. Uh, by the way, we were in West Borneo just last month. We were on our mission trip, four-week mission trip, in which we did visit Batu Ampar, the place where we spent seven years. If you missed our earlier sharing, or you would like to have the file of the book, Dancing on the Edge of the Earth, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Okay. This is a map of West Kalimantan or West Borneo in Indonesia. You see the city of Pontianak uh, right there. And to the south, you see Batu Ampat. That's where we spent seven years. There are no roads leading from Pontianak to Batu Ampat. You can come only by boat. Okay. Um, okay. Now, there was a young single man named Martin in our congregation. Okay, there you see our congregation. He's probably sitting somewhere there. And uh, he had been faithfully attending our meetings, and he had shown some interest in serving the Lord. Uh, Martin had even helped lead an ethnic Chinese man, whose name was Chao Wong and his wife, to the Lord in the sawmill where they worked as laborers. 
So Martin, he led this Chinese family to the Lord. Uh, the father's name was Chao Wang. Okay? Now, although Martin lacked refinement in his manner, we were quite pleased with his spiritual growth. And so we could not believe it one afternoon when our dear sister Lan Yi, remember Lan Yi? Well, she stopped by and told us something was going on between Martin and the ethnic Chinese man's wife. His wife, well, we would call her Sister Chao Wang. Now, Lan Yi would often drop by sometimes every morning and share with us what she had heard uh, about the church, what the outsiders were saying. And uh, often her frequent reports were usually accurate, but we thought in this case, her suspicions had gotten the better of her judgment. It didn't make any sense that Martin would run off with Chao Wong. Chao Wong So Sister Chao Wong, it didn't make any sense. Martin was a vigorous man in his 20s, and Sister Chao Wong was a very plain looking woman in her 30s, whose oldest of several children was already 16 years old. And so Lan Yi's talk did not make any sense to us. But several days later, we were forced to swallow our doubts. Sister Lan Yi burst into the house one morning. She said, Pastor, Sister Chao Wang has left her husband and has run off with Martin. And my wife Lucille answered in half belief, Lan Yi, you're kidding. And now she what? And Lan Yi said, Martin and Sister Chao Wang eloped. Her husband has gone to the police. The police found them and arrested them. They're being held at police headquarters on another island. And so this was a very serious matter. An hour later, Brother Elias, who was another disciple of ours, he and myself, we were on our way to the island to see Chao Wang, the husband. We went to see the husband first. Turned out the matter was very serious. A scandal involving the police and accusations of adultery and wife stealing in our church would only add to the controversy surrounding our church among the unbelievers. Chao Wong had gone directly to the police without seeking mediation from us. Unless something could be done within the church, our work would suffer shame. Now, Brother Chao Wong, the husband, was not at home. But his next door neighbor, he had a next door neighbor whose name was A Song. He was also a Chinese man. He saw us and he came outside to talk to us. Now, like Chao Wong, his neighbor, A Song also worked in the sawmill, but to supplement his income, he moonlighted as a sorcerer. A Song. He came up to me and addressed me politely. Pastor, Chao Wong has gone to the police station. Do you know what happened? And I answered somewhat sheepishly, yes, yeah, I know what happened. And then A Sung said to me, that Martin is a bad guy. I could almost hear the glee in his voice. And he said, Martin would come here often, several times a week. Sometimes he spent the night in their home. They thought he came to help them, but now he's run off with Chao Wang's wife. He used black magic to make her fall in love with him, A Sung said to me. Under my breath, I replied to him silently, black magic? Huh, you probably had something to do with it. You see, A Sung was a sorcerer. And then I told A Sung, we're going to see them. Maybe we can convince Sister Chao Wang to go back to her husband. A Sung said to me, ha, forget about it. It's a very powerful spell that's on her. You won't be able to break it. Now, this man was challenging us. More than that, I felt he was purposely challenging the Lord whom we served. And then A Sung said to me, if you can get Sister Chao Wang to return to her husband... I promise to kneel before you. Now, a Sung stinging challenge was ringing in my ears, and so I could not back down. No way. 
And so later we boarded a small water taxi heading for the island where Sister Chao Wang was being held at the police station. <clears throat> Our little wooden craft chugged its way toward the big island across the harbor from Batu Ampar. 20 minutes later, we disembarked at the pier in front of the police station. I went to see the police chief. He was glad to see me. He had already tried to persuade Sister Chao Wang to go back to her husband. She had refused, preferring to drown herself in the sea than to part with Martin. She wanted to get married to Martin. But the chief had informed her that it was not such a simple matter. She had broken Indonesian law by running off with another man. Her husband had filed formal charges. If she persisted in her madness, the chief would have no choice to imprison her. Adultery is against the law in Indonesia. And prison in Indonesia is a dreaded place where inmates, whether convicted or not, forfeit the right to their physical safety. She would not want to go to jail. Yet even this threat could not dissuade her from leaving Martin. And so the pastor said to me, excuse me, the chief, the chief of police said to me, he was a dark complexioned, heavy set Javanese man. He said to me, pastor, if you would like, please talk with Sister Chao Wong. If as her religious authority, you can settle the matter and get her to reunite with her husband, he will probably drop the charges. Then we can forget the whole matter. Otherwise, it will be very messy. And that was precisely what I wanted and hoped to avoid. And so I agreed to see her. And so Brother Elias and I were taken to a room adjoining the chief's office. Sister Chao Wang was led into the room and seated at a plain wooden chair. She was left alone with Brother Elias and myself. Her face was sullen and hardened. She looked down at her lap, motionless. And I thought to myself, wow, she's changed. She's not the same person. It must be the spell that Martin put on her, probably with the help of Asung the sorcerer. So Brother Elias went over to her and speaking to her in Chinese, the Hakka dialect of Chinese. Sister Chao Wang, he said softly, pastor has come to see you. She made no response. Again, Brother Elias spoke to her, but it was as if we were not there. And so I sat down next to her. Sister Chao Wang, I said, we're here to help you. Uh, Elias, Brother Elias translated what I said in English into Hakka Chinese. And so I paused, but there was no response from Sister Chao Wang. I said to her, Martin put a spell on you. It made you fall in love with him. You left your husband. You left your children. The little ones still need you. You know this is not right. Satan has done to you, I continued. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy you. The police told me that if you don't go, if you don't go back to your husband, you'll go to jail. I waited for a few moments for my words to sink in. Sister Chao Wang, I know you still want to go with Martin, but may we pray for you so that you can think clearly and be free to do what is right? No, she lashed out abruptly. I want to go with Martin. I would rather die than go back to my husband. I don't want you to pray for me. I thought to myself, Ooh, this is going to be hard. We can pray for someone. We can minister to someone who wants to be set free, but she doesn't even want prayer to be set free. She doesn't even want to be set free. I said to her, Sister Chao Wang, we want to help you. You need help. Satan has blinded you. At least admit that you're blind and that you need help. At least let us pray for you and minister to you. No, she screamed. 
but you're God's child, and now you're sinning against him. I don't care, she retorted. I want to get married to Martin. I concluded, this is getting nowhere. Maybe we just have to minister to her whether she wants it or not. We'll just have to wrestle with her for Satan. I was not going to give up that easily. Sister Chao Wang's unfaithfulness to her husband would give much ammunition to the unbelievers in town to criticize us. And so I said to Brother Elias, okay, let's minister to her. He had been at my side translating my remarks from my Indonesian language into the local Chinese dialect of Hakka. Yeah, at that time, I was already speaking directly in Indonesian. And so whatever I said in Indonesian had to be translated into local Chinese dialect of Hakka. And so I began to minister to her. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke this demon from the spell cast by Martin. Oh, by the way, let me just back off for a moment. Nowadays, I no longer rebuke Satan, okay? I may have done that 40 years ago, it's possible. But uh, I do not rebuke Satan. Generally, I rebuke diseases and demons at ground level. So generally, I do not speak to Satan. Jesus can rebuke Satan, but me, who am I? I stay at ground level. I rebuke diseases and demons at ground level. So generally today, I do not rebuke Satan, okay? Now, let me go back to this story. I rebuke this demon from the spell cast by Martin. I command you to leave. As we continue to come against the spell, she closed her eyes and grit her teeth. She was not about to, del to be delivered from Satan's trap. In the name of Jesus, come out, demon. She sprang to her feet, trying to get away from us. But we cornered her. And we continued to exercise our authority in Christ. We got her into a corner so she couldn't get away. We continued to rebuke the demons, commanding her to be set free. In the name of Jesus, leave her, you unclean spirit. Like a collared animal, she struggled against our grip. But we would not let her go. She contorted her face, resisting our efforts with all her might. For about an hour, a very long hour, the battle continued. I began to tire. My thoughts flashed back to the tug of war I experienced with the dying baby girl at the sawmill. You might remember that. But this was different. This woman did not want our help. At least with the dying baby at the sawmill, the father wanted our help. But gradually, her resolve weakened. I noticed that her face was beginning to soften as we continued to rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. And she opened her eyes. It was at that point, as she was to relate to us later, that she felt power surge through her. The armor of deception suddenly fell away. She had never before felt such awesome power. It was the Lord. It convinced her that God was indeed real. Therefore, perseverance is essential in ministering to people who are demonized. Perseverance is essential. And then, sensing an opening, I asked her, Will you go back to your husband now? And she answered faintly, uh, No, not yet. Then I said, then, then come back to the church with us. You can stay with us for a while until you're ready to go back home. I, I, uh, all right, pastor, okay. And so meekly, yet with a bit of hesitation, she followed us down to the pier where, she, where we boarded a water taxi bound for Batuambad, for home. After Sister Chao Wang had settled down in an upstairs room in our home, we summoned Chao Wang and his children to come see her the next day. We arranged for the children to go in first. When her youngest child, 
a little adorable girl, four or five years old, walked into her room. Sister Chao Wong got up and embraced her, stroking her face tenderly. Then the other children joined them. Finally, her husband Chao Wong came in to see her, thoughtfully bringing hot noodles from the local Chinese takeout restaurant. That night in our home, after Chao Wong and the children had gone back to the sawmill, she had a dream. She saw herself drowning in the sea. An elderly man came by in a boat and rescued her. When she awoke, she understood what had nearly happened. That morning, Sister Chao Wong returned to her family. A few weeks later, we were surprised at our home by an unannounced visit by a Song, the sorcerer whom I had suspected had had a hand in the affair. After he exchanged greetings with us, he asked Lucio for some tea. Lucio went to the kitchen to get a cup of tea for him. It was somewhat unusual. After she came back and handed the tea to him, I sat down. He probably wanted to talk about something, but he knelt down at my feet, offering me the cup of tea with outstretched, <laughs> outstretched hands, outstretched arms. Alarmed, I jumped to my feet. But as I tried to pull him to his feet, he said, I'm just fulfilling my vow to you. Remember, I promised I would kneel before you if you brought Sister Chao Wong back to her husband? It wasn't me, I protested. It was the name of the Lord Jesus which delivered her. This is not right. Please get up. I think it was a taste of how awkward Paul the Apostle might have felt long ago when people tried to offer sacrifices to him after God had healed a lame man through him in Acts chapter 14. What an adventure. This narration was talking from our book, Dancing on the Edge of the Earth. If you'd like to have a copy, if you'd like to have the file, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us today. I hope to see you next week, in which I'm going to introduce to you the anointing and what does the Bible say about it.